Welcome everyone to the, um, the panel discussion on demystifying the process of um, studying and living abroad. Uh, I, I am Dr. Esprin Little Quinton and I will be the moderator for today's panel discussion. I'm going to share some more details about myself to give you some more insight into who I am. Um, so you're all familiar with, with, with the work that I do and why I became interested in actually um, putting on this panel discussion. So I received my undergraduate degree from the University of Guyana. Then I moved to the US where I attended and the Penn State Harrisburg and I received my master's degree at Penn State Harrisburg. Then I proceeded to Miami and I received my PhD at the University of Miami in community well-being. And currently I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Rutgers University. And in my current role, I am a, a researcher. And in my role, I serve and I lead rather um, several research projects focused on gun violence and domestic violence. So the research that I do really helps to inform policies and a lot of decision-making process, processes um, regarding gun violence and domestic violence. Now, I decided to organize this panel discussion because um, I recognize, recognize that there was a great interest in understanding the path different folks have taken to receive their graduate degree or undergraduate degree. And um, based on that interest that I have recognized over several years, I've realized that there's a need to have a discussion uh, about the process that folks have taken to receive or earn their undergraduate or graduate degree abroad. So this um, panel discussion is really about helping folks to understand the path that different individuals have taken to yield that outcome of receiving that undergraduate or, or graduate degree. So there might be um, parents in the room who might be interested in having their high school graduate attend um, college abroad. We have folks in the room, someone who's on the panel has received her undergraduate degree from um, a university of um, abroad. So she'll be able to speak some more about her experience. There are some folks who probably might be in the room who um, are currently at um, University of Guyana and they're wondering, they're con completing their undergraduate degree and you might be wondering, how do I pursue a degree abroad? Maybe you, you're interested in um, pursuing a master's degree or, or a PhD. We're gonna talk through the process that we've all gone through um, to receive our degrees and how we've studied, been able to study and we're, um, some of us are still living abroad. So I'm hoping that this entire discussion will benefit um, everyone in the room. Um, there's, and I've realized that um, for the years that I've, I've worked with, with students and with other individuals who've lived, uh, who, are, who are back home in Guyana, I recognize that not everyone has access to a network of people who could help them to navigate this path of getting to or receiving a degree abroad. And um, I really want to spend this time helping us to deconstruct that process a little bit more and demystify that process so it's not that nebulous and it doesn't seem as though we're hoarding knowledge and we're not sharing how we've been able to um, successfully complete our degrees abroad and are also we're currently living abroad. So I'm hoping that in this space um, again we can benefit from this discussion and we're going to have a an organic conversation where all of the panelists will, will respond to a series of questions that I will ask them. And some of these questions range in, in topics. We're gonna to be discussing um, things related or topics related to academics, how folks in the room have experienced um, classes abroad, which might look different from classes that you probably have done in high school or, or, or at the University of Guyana. We're also going to be talking about finances, budgeting. Some folks in the room might be interested also in understanding how folks have applied for scholarships. I know that's a big topic and um, everyone wants to know how can we pay for our university abroad. University degrees abroad are very expensive, so we want to at least give you some insight into 
what that process looks like. So hopefully it could benefit you or authors who um, you think might um, be might benefit from this this discussion. So. For those of you who may not be familiar with Zoom, Zoom has a chat box at the bottom of your screen. So we're going to hold some space for a discussion among all of the panelists. And then after that discussion, we're gonna move in and we're gonna have a segment, a question and answer segment. So while we're talking, while we're having this discussion, please feel free to put your questions in the chat box below. And we're gonna to try to get to the, as many as, of those questions as possible. Um, I'm going to ask you also to hold your questions also um, to we're going to hold space at the end for additional questions and for folks to also open up their mic um, by raising their hand using the um, raised hand emoji and um, we're going to just call on folks in the order in which they appear on my screen. So the I want to emphasize that this panel discussion um, is not targeting folks who are interested in pursuing a degree at home in Guyana. We are not discouraging folks to apply for advanced degrees, a master's degree or a PhD at the University of Guyana. This panelist is really geared for those who um, might be interested in studying abroad and there's nothing wrong with going to the University of Guyana and receiving your degree. You're gonna hear from a lot of the panelists on, on, on your screen right now. A lot of the panelists have received their undergraduate degrees from the University of Guyana and it has served as an important foundation for them to move on to um, pursue their higher education abroad. So again, this is not to say that going to the University of Guyana should not be your option. So on our panel today, I'm going to um, move forward to introducing the panelists and we have a wonderful selection of panelists. The first person that appears on my screen is Kalisha Letlo Perun. And Kalisha is an attorney at law licensed in Ontario, Canada. She's the founder of KYL Law Firm, which is an immigration and family law firm located in Toronto, Ontario. Kalisha received her master's degree in environmental policy from Memorial University in Canada, and she will be speaking about her experience studying and living abroad in Canada. So if you have any questions for her and um, the services that she offers with her law firm, um, we're gonna try to address as many of those questions as possible during this panel discussion. Next on my screen, we have Onika Ben. Um, Mrs. Onika Ben, she currently serves as the Director of Economic Development at the Linden Fund USA. She completed her Master's of Science degree in Sustainable Environmental Management at the University of Greenwich in the United Kingdom. The next person that appears on my screen is Ms. Alethea McDavid. Alethea was born and raised in Georgetown, Guyana. After, uh, after taking CAPE and the SAT, she traveled to Tampa, Florida in 2016 to pursue her degree in civil engineering at the University of South Florida. She then received, she then graduated rather magna cum laude in 2020 and started a full-time position at Landis Evans and Partner which is a company where um, she also completed her internship. Alitia will be, Althea Ratha, will be taking, will be talking about her transition from high school. Um, Althea attended Queens College. She's gonna be talking about her transition from Queens College um, over to an undergraduate degree in the US. So for those folks who might be high school students, um, Alitia is a great point person to get some more insight um, on that transition. Um, next, we have Dr. Royston Quinton. Dr. Royston Quinton is a senior application scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, he utilizes mass spectrometry to provide solutions to complex problems in medical research and pharmaceutical industries. As a former lecturer and head of Department of Chemistry at the University of Guyana, Dr. Quinton has a wealth of experience teaching and advising students at the University of Guyana. 
He is also an accomplished researcher. He has published articles in major scientific journals and has given talks at various seminars and international conferences. Currently, Dr. Quinton manages a global team and where he collaborates with research scientists from several major biopharmaceutical companies to develop an innovative strategy to monitor the efficiency of monoclonal antibodies. Dr. Quinton holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in chemistry from the University of Guyana, a Master's of Science degree um, in, chemical in chemical research from Queen Mary University of London, and a PhD in analytical chemistry from the Ohio State University. So I would like to welcome all of the panelists and thank you so much for agreeing to participate in this, um, in this discussion. We also had advertised that we would have um, Sherlock Langevin on our panel. And Sherlock Langevin is an international student from Guyana. He studies chemical engineering at Stanford University. And um, he was very eager to join us, but unfortunately he is unable to join us um, because of a medical emergency that he's currently undergoing as we speak. So I'm wishing um, Sherlock well, best wishes, and I'm hoping that he has a speedy recovery. Now, if you have any specific questions for Sherlock, feel free to let me know in the chat and I can share his email with you. He's, um, since he's unable to make it, he's agreed to um, engage in any discussions around um, his experience at Stanford University. So let me know and I'll share his um, chat in the email. Nevertheless, we have a wonderful, strong team of panelists with diverse experiences studying and living abroad. And um, you might not necessarily see someone on this panelist who is from a, your specific area of interest or discipline. Um, but I would encourage you to not get discouraged because you're not seeing someone from your discipline. Um, all of our panelists have vast experiences living and studying abroad. So I would encourage you to um, pay attention to their broad, the broad information that they're sharing with you. I'm confident that with their experience, our discussion will be very fruitful and we hopefully will help to demystify the process of um, studying and living abroad. Now, if you believe we still have folks joining us, we have a strong team of four to four um, participants or attendees who are joining us and there's still some folks in the waiting room that we're listening. in. Um, if you believe that this um, Zoom and this panel discussion will benefit others, please feel free to share this Zoom link with others. There's still some more time for other folks to join the room and can, they can all benefit from our panel discussion. So what I'm gonna do at this point in time is um, for easy access, I'm going to share the Zoom link and feel free to email it to someone and let them know um, that we're live. I know sometimes folks forget about panel discussions. We've advertised it um, for some time now. So feel free to let others know if you feel as though they'll benefit from the conversation. Um, so we're going to have a fire chat conversation. Um, I'm going to ask a series of questions to all of the panelists, and we're going to answer the questions in the order in which you, they appear on my screen. So there's Kalisha, Anika, Althea, and then Dr. Quinton. And at times, we're going to probably just um, freelance our conversation where anyone could just jump in at any time to have um, have a discussion. So we might not necessarily always go in the order in which you appear on the screen. Um, so one other thing I would like to mention before we just get into the chat, um, this will be a welcoming space and I want everyone to feel comfortable contributing to the conversation. Um, we're going to have this space as a judgment-free space. So if you feel uncomfortable with the fluency of your English, just speak in Creolese that's fine with me. Um, if you feel uncomfortable putting, um, sharing your, asking your question on, on, on the, in the open to everyone by unmuting your microphone, feel free to have your questions, write your questions in the chat. If you're concerned about misspelling things in the chat, 
don't be concerned about that. Um, we'll try our best to just make sense of what you write in the chat. So don't feel uncomfortable if you're, you're not fluent in, in writing perfect English. That's fine also. So um, please ensure, I want to ensure that this space is a comfortable and welcoming space for everyone to just feel comfortable asking whatever questions you want to ask the panelists about their experience um, living and studying abroad. And we're going to try our best to, to answer those questions in a non-judgmental um, format. All right, so that was a mouthful. And um, I apologize for my camera. I'm not sure what's happening with my camera, but I promise that it's going to stay on. It's just flickering a little bit. I think it's the why, the connection with my wire. All right, so let's go ahead and get things started <laughs> um, for the panelists. So I want to begin this conversation with asking all the panelists to tell us all um, on the Zoom at this moment, tell us all about, can you just, okay, walk us through your experience transitioning from Guyana. You probably have completed your undergraduate degree in Guyana or your high school, um, received in high school certificate in Guyana. How did you transition from that to receiving a, master's or doctoral degree abroad. And I'm going to begin with Kalisha, who appears first in my school. Good evening, everyone. I obtained my bachelor's of laws from the University of Guyana. And I always wanted to do um, environmental policy from more with a focus on a social justice perspective. And that was not something that was available in Guyana. So I, the first place that I was looking was the United Kingdom and I did apply to a school in the United Kingdom. And I also, then I applied to a school in the US and I was hoping to get a scholarship. I had gotten a partial scholarship for the program in the United States, but I could not afford or come up with the rest of the tuition. So I started looking at Canada and most of my relatives, I have quite a lot of relatives living in Canada. So I figured, well, you know, maybe I should just focus on Canada because it would probably help with some of the finances. If you have relatives there, then you can stay with relatives and not have to worry about accommodation. So I found a program that, you know, that at the, sorry, Memorial University of Newfoundland, and it ticked all the boxes for me. And thankfully, I got a grant from that school that covered my tuition fee. So that took like a lot of the load uh, off. So I decided to just run with that. And it was a one year program. So I spent one year in, in Newfoundland. I did a work placement in another province. And so at the end of one year, I had my master's degree and um, that was how it, it was for me. I would say it was an interesting experience um, transitioning from Guyana to Canada, and especially for me going to a province that is not as populated as, as other provinces in Canada. And I also attended the, I didn't, my program was not being offered at a main campus. It was being offered at one of the smaller campuses, which was located in a small city where you don't see a lot of people looking like me. And it was to the extent that during like, you know, the first few weeks there, you would literally walk beyond the street and people would be driving and staring because they're not accustomed to seeing somebody with my shade. Um, I wasn't treated anyway, you know, like differently, but I still had to adjust to being in that, um, in that environment. I would also say that um, while it was, a, it was a good experience, it's also, good to have a support system in place when you're studying abroad and that might not necessarily have to be family it could be friends of family or it could even be a church um, my church played a very important role in supporting me in this process so um, if you have a support system that would definitely help all right so we're going to move um, to Anika Alpia then Dr. Quinton Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you so much. Um, so my journey, I would say, is 
perhaps a little bit unorthodox. I did not set out with a plan to study abroad. Um, I attended Queens College, but in my third form, I failed. And after repeating the year, I said to myself that I never wanted to experience failure. So at that point, I, I wrote a life plan for 15 years after, and that included a master's. Where I would do it, I did not know. So after Queens College, all of my friends were going to UG. So I also um, went to UG. Um, I did my first degree there in environmental studies. And I am extremely competitive and very outgoing. So I got involved in everything that UG had to offer, working at UG, traveling through a job that connected me through UG. And it really opened my eyes to possibilities of things elsewhere and it's at that point I guess I started thinking about the possibility of studying overseas I don't have family in the diaspora I do have a cousin in the states but um, no other family members overseas so there was never a question of me going at someone or getting support from someone I didn't think at some point I would study overseas. So as a part of my plan, I, I wanted to get just a little bit of work experience. So I worked for two years. And I think what helped me that I surrounded myself with people who were doing the things that I wanted to do, which was applying to masters. Now, I didn't have internet access at home where I lived. So I wasn't reading about schools. I didn't know where what universities were available. I didn't know the timelines. I knew nothing. Uh, but what I did know was a band called One Direction. And then you were from the United Kingdom. And so that got me thinking, maybe I want to go to the UK. So I started, um, you know, talking with my friends to find out um, what you let with me. Um, that I, I would say the booklet that was shared with me really helped me to narrow my focus. So I then looked through the universities. Um, I My approach was to find a program that I felt comfortable with and a program that I liked. I did not look at the cost. I didn't look at the part of the United Kingdom that the university was located in. I didn't look at the level of the university, whether it was the highest in the world or the lowest. I knew that it would have been a good university, but what I wanted to do was something that would have been relevant to my interests and my passions. So I, I applied to the University of Greenwich and I got an unconditional offer and I was over the moon because this happened in the space of a month um, that I got this unconditional offer and it was then I recognized that international students have a different fee than local students and I didn't know how I was going to pay this I just knew that God was going to provide because I felt that if he allowed me to get into the university, then he would also provide for me going to the university. I must say that I graduated with a credit from the University of Guyana, but that did not stop me with thinking that I needed to have a GP of three point anything to get into uh, an international university. I did have one F on my profile, but it never stopped me from believing that I could do it. So I applied, I got got the unconditional offer. Unfortunately, had no scholarships available. So I wrote a letter requesting uh, funding to go to university. And in this letter, I detailed everything I did for my country because I was so outgoing. I participated in several programs and several clubs, volunteering for Guyana. And I felt like I was a perfect candidate to receive a scholarship. Um, there were negative voices because when I first called the ministry, uh, I, I don't know who I spoke with. That person encouraged me to write the letter because you never know what can happen. But me not knowing the process called back to find out who I needed to address the letter to. And the voice that answered the phone the second time said to me, don't write no letter. We don't accept letters that come just like that. You need to wait until something is published in the newspaper, until we're offering scholarships, and then you write it. But my faith in God really helped me to listen to the first 
person that I spoke to who said, you know what, write the letter. At this point in time, I'm at a no. If I write a letter, I have a possibility of getting a yes. So I wrote that letter and within two weeks, I was granted a full scholarship with everything covered uh, for me to attend university. I would say that God was so good that they even gave me extra money above what was required. And so throughout that year, I had zero concerns about where I was going to get money from, how things would have been covered. I got my research covered. I was able to hire students to assist me with my research. And it was a really great experience for me. Fitting in was, I don't know if, if it's necessarily my personality or because I stayed in um, Kent, which I find to be a bit more of the countryside. So it felt like I was just in another part of Guyana. I did not feel uh, any change or any shock being in that part of the country, um, but it was a really good experience. And when I got to the university, I again went full into everything that was happening. I decided that I'm going to graduate and I'm going to graduate well. However, my main focus wasn't only studies. I took part in the drama club. Um, I acted in plays. I did everything that the university had to offer. I worked with the university as well. So that helped me to bring in even more additional funds and use that opportunity whilst there to travel to Paris and you know do other things. So I would say um, that's just my experience living and studying abroad. I know you'll have more specific questions, but that's how I transitioned to the UK and then back to Guyana. All right, thanks, Anika. Um, Althea, I know, I know we're we're gonna have a lot more questions. Um, so I'm gonna ask all of you. So let's let's move over to Alicia, uh, Althea, and then uh, Dr. Quinton. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I just want to say that Miss Ben's transition was quite, it sounded wonderful. Um, hopefully I don't uh, discourage you with uh, some of my experiences here, but um, I guess because I was I transitioned from high school to undergraduate in the US. My experience was a little bit different, but um, I, so I studied, I did private school for basic high school, like through fifth form. And then I did CAPE at Queens College. And I will say that CAPE helped a lot in me applying for universities um, abroad for undergraduate. Then after CAPE, I didn't know what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. I just wanted to focus on CAPE. So after I completed CAPE, I took a year off and I focused on writing the SATs and figuring out where I wanted to go. Um, I did pretty well at the SATs and I started considering various places. And like Kalisha, I wanted somewhere that had some sort of support system. And I always wanted to travel abroad because I wanted to, you know, broaden my horizons, give myself more opportunities um, and build some independence, you know. Uh, so I looked everywhere pretty much. I looked at Trinidad and Jamaica, you know, University of West Indies. I had family there. I looked at Canada. I looked at the UK. And it basically came down to money. Um, I got into everywhere that I applied to, but it was just way too expensive, even with the scholarships that I was given. So I, I did actually, like Miss Ben, I wrote to the ministry to try and get funds, and I never got a response. So actually, I got a response after my first year of university. So <laughs> that's kind of um, counterproductive. But what happened was, thankfully, um, I had a, a Guyanese professor, actually, Dr. Maya Trotz, some of you may know her. She works at the University of South Florida, and she was advertising this Latin American and Caribbean scholarship that USF does. And the scholarship basically grants the international student um, in-state fees, which, as you, the panelists, know, is significantly cheaper than international fees. So um, I was granted that scholarship, but obviously we still had to find other funds. So my parents helped me with the first semester after which I had to work every um, semester since. And that's basically how I paid for my tuition. Thankfully, I graduated without any student loans or anything, but it was a lot of hard work. Um, I always had to have a job. I always had to be applying for scholarships. Um, 
lots of budgeting, lots of sacrifices in terms of maybe not, you know, going to as many events, not being able to travel. Um, so it was definitely, it was a tough experience, but I, I learned a lot and I'm grateful for the experience. Um, I grew so much. Uh, I wouldn't have changed the experience for the world. I met amazing people. I, you know, found strengths in myself that I would not have known were there if I didn't take the leap. So I'm glad I did. I did, however, participate in organizations um, related to engineering. So I was in a concrete canoe committee. Yes, concrete does float if you design it the right way. Um, and there I met several uh, engineering firms uh, connected with them networked and that's how I got the position I currently have at Landis Evans and Partners um, as a staff engineer. So that's kind of the long and short of it. And I guess I'll turn things over to Dr. Quinton. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna take kind of like a, a different take on the situation. I know everyone started with where they ended up. I'm going to start with where I started. And part, partly because um, I do have to give a shout out to the University of Guyana. You know, I spent quite a bit of time there, both as a student and uh, a lecturer. So I remember when, um, just to step back a little bit, when I was at um, in high school, so I, um, like Altia and Onika, attended Queen's College. And um, like everyone, you know, who goes to Queen's College, many people, when they write CXC or they write A-levels, they go outside and they study, right? You know, they either do well at CXC, they write SAT and they go, etc. So I had those um, aspirations to, to study abroad. However, um, my CXC grades weren't as um, good enough for me to do that. So I went, I did A-levels. Right, I did um, reasonably okay at A levels, but again, I could not um, get any scholarships or anything like that to go to school. So I ended up at the University of Guyana. So I was initially disappointed, but as usual, you know, you someone gives you lemons, you make lemonade, right? So I hunkered down, I studied, and um, I was able to graduate within three years because I was able to, um, due to A levels and my grades, I was able to skip the first year and go straight into second year. So I spent three years at the University of Vienna, after which I um, became an assistant lecturer. For three years, I was an assistant lecturer and every single year I, I applied for universities. I applied for universities in the UK, I applied for universities in the US and first year, nothing, second year, nothing. Third year, right? Three, three is a charm. I got through it to two universities. One was at um, in London, the Queen Mary University of London. And then the other one was University of Manchester. I ended up going to Queen Mary University of London because they gave me a partial scholarship. So they paid half and I had to pay half. So like um, everyone, you know, Onika and Altia, I decided to ask for funding because I did not have the finances to, um, you know, pay for that, right? It's not U.S. dollars. It was pounds. And back then, the pound was two, two U.S. dollars to one pound. So it was a lot. So I had a friend who he and I got this bright idea. We wrote letters and we would go every single day to businessmen asking them for money. Right. So we went, walked up and down Regent Street. We went to ministries. We went everywhere and we didn't get anything. Then I was like, you know what? Here will happen. I have half a scholarship. I'm just going to trust God, go to university and somehow, somehow it's going to make, make a way. So I went to London. I stayed by a family friend at um, a severely reduced um, rent. So I had to work in order to pay, pay for rent and pay for food. But after a couple of weeks, I still hadn't um, been able to figure out how I was going to pay, right, for my um, tuition. And it came and they came to me and they were like, you know, um, you've got to tell us how you're going to pay. Well, I was just flooded with emotions and to be frank with you, I just broke down and cried in, in, in my professor's um, room and you know, he said, okay, then, you know, we're going to try to figure out a solution because I was doing very well at school. And um, one of the things I remember one of the professors saying is that, you know, a lot of us like to knock the University of Guyana 
But when they looked at my, um, my degree and the courses that I did in the chemistry department, they said that this was one of the strongest programs that they'd ever seen in chemistry. And that's part of the reasons why they, um, you know, they accepted me. So that's just a shout out to the chemistry program at the University of Guyana. You know, it gave me the platform to where I am today. So yes, it was one of the strongest programs they'd ever seen. And that propelled me to get me to where I was and what I was doing. So my professor, um, you know, with the help of another professor, what they did is they were able to work out with the university that the school was going to pay half of the remainder. And then um, I was doing research in um, nuclear magnetic re resonance, NMR. And one of the companies who make the instruments that I was working on, they paid the other half. So not only did they pay the other half, but it afforded me the opportunity to, um, you know, go to their manufacturing site in Germany. And I um, spent about like two weeks there doing research with them. So that's how I was able to go uh, to, to get my, um, my master's funded. So after that, I returned to um, Guyana and I lectured again for two more years. So after, you know, lecturing, I decided, you know what, okay, then a master's was good. Um, I have a good thing going, but I really was interested in research. I, I've always been interested in research. So I figured, you know, in order for me to do what I needed, you know, a master's is going to only get you into certain places, but you need a bigger stick, right? So the bigger stick was the PhD. So I decided, okay, then now it's time to search for a PhD. So I started looking at schools. And um, like being the competitor I am, I started looking at the high schools, one, two, three, four, five, you know, all the top analytical schools. So I was fortunate enough to get into one of the top ones, which was at University of Arizona. So I graduated. I, um, sorry, I applied. I got a fully funded scholarship because I was going to be a teacher assistant. So um, yeah, so I left for Arizona. Now, for those of you who, who know anything about Arizona, Arizona is the middle of the desert. When I got there, I said, I now see why this is a good school. Because when you go to Arizona, there's nothing you can do other than study. There's <laughs> mountains to the left, there's mountains, mountains to the east, mountains to the west, mountains to the north, mountains to the south. All there is in Tucson, Arizona is a university and everything is surround, you know, about the university. So I spent two years there and then my um, professor decided that she wanted to be closer to her family and that's how I ended up at the Hawaii State University. Which luckily for me, I had two friends who were there. So when my professor, I, I still remember it was like yesterday when she came and she told us that, you know, she's moving and she wants, you know, we have the choice of whether to stay at University of Arizona or to go with her. My first question is, where are you moving to? Because I wanted to get out of the desert. So if she was going to Timbuktu, I probably would have gone with her. But then she said Ohio State. And I was over the moon because now I would have, you know, Guyanese friends in Arizona. It was me, myself, and I, right? So I made the move to Ohio State. And there, um, you know, I, grad I spent some time and I did some, I did a lot of research. I did a lot of traveling. You know, and I graduated in uh, 2015 with my um, PhD. I will leave all the rest for, I'm sure that um, Dr. Little Quentin has many more questions. So I will leave the rest of stories as I answer those. But that was just my journey. All right, so thanks everyone. Um, it seems as though everyone had um, somewhat similar and unique um, journeys to their advanced degrees. And um, I'm so grateful that you all have decided to open up and share your path to receiving your, your advanced degrees. So um, there, there are a number of things that we heard from, from the panelists. Um, there seems to be different ways in which folks have earned or received um, a scholarship. So everyone jumped into a scholarship. So let's just start to a scholarship since I know that's probably the burning question for many, many attendees on, on the panel. 
So um, scholarships can look very different for everyone. Some folks on the panel have received grants, um, a grant or grants from their university. Some folks have received funding directly from their university. Some other folks have, have um, pursued what I call um, professionally asking for money. Um, so, and, and they've been able to receive money by professionally asking for money from the university. Some folks have launched out um, in faith, going to a university without having any funding at all, and and hope and their professors have recognized, you know, the great work that they're doing and have decided to fund them while they are um, they were there. So as you can see, there are different paths to get in scholarships. Um, if I, I'm missing anything or any specific questions you want me to ask the panelists, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'm going to try to get to them. But one of the things that I would like to add um, with regards to scholarships is um, every, well, I'm going to talk about my experience um, receiving my PhD from, from the University of Miami and also receiving my master's from Penn State Harrisburg. So one of the things that I would encourage folks to do is not be afraid to ask. Now, some folks walk down the streets of Georgetown trying to raise funds. There are now very unique ways in which you can raise funds. You can do a GoFundMe page. I will say, choose all avenues to try to see if you can get funds. You can, you know, seek out funds from, from, the, um, from different administrations. And um, also there are some funds that are also available online. If you type in like funds for international students and pay attention to deadlines that these um, funding sources um, have have put out there, you should be able to get at least, sometimes you would be able to secure um, a $5,000 or $10,000, and that could go towards paying housing and, and, uh, and other expenses. It might not be it might not be a large sum of money, but at least it's some money that could help you to um, pay some of an offset of your expenses living abroad. Um, so for some schools, particularly for graduate schools, since um, I have that experience um, abroad. For graduate schools, sometimes it's good to look for schools or look for programs that say that they would offer tuition remission. So tuition remission essentially means that the school is going to fund all of your, pay for all of your expenses for the duration of the time that you will be at that university. So how do you find out about that? Um, it's a good idea to read their website and some, and some schools do not make it explicit that they're going to pay for your tuition. So it's a good idea to reach out to a professor that you want to um, work with and try to find out some more about what scholarships look like. Because there's so many people who are interested in getting scholarships, sometimes this information is not necessarily always advertised. But some schools have endowments, which means that a lot of people with a lot of money put, put money into a pool and that money is available to fund students. It's not always made aware. They don't always advertise it, but you have to ask. I know sometimes in Ghana, it's a, you know, there's this concern about emailing someone. The world works with emails. And I think it's time for us to be comfortable emailing folks. And usually for the folks and professors that I've worked with when I've had to apply for schools, sometimes um, depending on the time of the semester and how busy they are, you can get a 24 turn around response from professors who are interested in you. Just takes a simple email. Hi, my name is XYZ. I'm interested in pursuing this PhD program at your college. Is there funding available? I'm not able to provide funding. So a well-worded and crafted um, email to a professor usually helps to get a massage uh, and get you into the door a little bit. Um, I know some other panelists might have some more things to say about that. Um, so um, what I want to talk about also is the, for particularly for undergraduate, um, an undergraduate degree. And Althea, I'm going to probably ask you to speak to this a little bit more. What exactly do folks need to know about with regards to preparing to going into an undergraduate degree? Can you talk about test scores and all of these things that, that you usually have to um, get yourself um, prepared for before applying to an undergraduate degree? 
Sure. Um, so one of the tools that I used that was pretty helpful actually was the, the SAT. They have a, a college board website and it has resources for not only applying to colleges, but knowing what you would need to get into specific colleges. And it's also stuff you can research if you if there's a particular college you're interested in to kind of get an idea of what is expected. So it usually tells you, you know, the SAT scores that they're expecting or the GPAs they're expecting or the kinds of you know courses that they expect you to, to have as prerequisites kind of thing. So um, I kind of use that as a go by. I didn't know exactly where I wanted to go, but I picked, I didn't go all the way to Ivy League, um, but you know, NYU or you know just a particular college, and I think it had you had to have at least fourteen hundred or something like that. So I aimed for that at the SATs, and also um, it was recommended that you you do subject tests. So SATs also have subject tests, um, not just the general writing, um, math, whatever. You can do like physics, chemistry, just to kind of make yourself stand out um, amongst other students. So I did physics and I did um, pure maths as well. So I think that also helped with my applications. And then the, the website, and there are other websites that do this as well. There's it's like one platform where you can send your application in and you can apply to multiple places at the same time. So um, I did that. Um, and I guess that was mostly my, my tactic. I didn't really have a lot to go on. I did get a lot of advice. Um, the reason I did the SATs, I took the year off because I, I was given advice that I needed to do well, both in CAPE and in the SATs to really push myself, you know, um, be above and beyond. I know Miss Ben talked about, you know, the GPA not really being a big deal. I think for master's and PhD, once you've established yourself as in academia, it is a little bit easier. But for undergrad, I at least from what I was told, it's a lot more difficult to get in from high school to undergrad, especially overseas without having something excellent, whether that be GPA or something significant that you have done to make yourself stand out. So that's basically what I aimed for. And I guess how I got where I where I am. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Althea. Um, is anyone, did anyone in the panel complete, you know, standardized tests to get into their graduate school? Did anyone do that? No? Yes. The GREs, did anyone do any of that? No, but um, what I should what I should point out is that if you're looking to get into um, graduate school in the U.S., you typically have to do GRE. However, as um, Dr. Liddell Clinton was saying, if you do not ask, you never will know. So when I um, applied for um, you know my graduate, um, what you call it at University of Arizona, they, they requested that I do a GRE, but I asked for a GRE waiver, right? And there are instances where they will grant you a waiver. So I already had a master's. I was lecturing for a number of years, you know? So I was like, why do I have to write GRE? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching the same things that you're gonna do. So if you can craft a well-worded um, letter, in many cases, they will grant you that waiver. Because all the GRE is doing, it's looking for them to have a baseline as to where you are, right? The same thing with SAT, because you have many people coming from many different places and it's just a baseline to see, okay, then how do you match up with, you know, the students that are here domestically? So yes, they may ask for a GRE, but you can request for a GRE waiver. And um, if you are able to, you know, show them that you can, you, you can be able to um, get that. Okay. So um, I see Dr. Paris, another great resource to receive information from. Um, Dr. Paris is making the point that some schools are moving away from GRE and um, they're not necessarily requiring GRE. So for so some folks who are thinking about applying to schools online, um, abroad rather, um, yeah, pay attention to if those schools have waived GRE because I think the idea around moving away from GRE scores is because there's now this movement where a lot of um, students are, are arguing and advocating for themselves, saying that GRE schools um, make contribute to some of the disparities that you see with regards to folks 
who are accepted into universities. So not everyone has the funds to start go um, and complete GRE um, exams. It costs a lot of money to complete GRE exams. Not everyone has those funds. So some of the schools are realizing that the playing field is not equal. So they're saying, okay, we don't necessarily always need GRE scores for folks to come in. And that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily always a great litmus test for if a student will successfully um, complete their school, um, their degree abroad. So some schools are saying, you know what, we don't need it for everyone. So pay attention to that also. Um, for for the, all of the panelists, can you talk about, yes, Onika, any contributions to that? Yes, um, very quickly, I wanted to um, just speak to attending school in the UK. Um, I used my university degree, um, my University of Ghana degree, without having to send my transcript, that was fine for me to enter. But when I spoke to some of my other friends who were in the same year as me at university and applied to schools in the UK, they too were able to use just their university degree and sometimes their CAPE results to enter. So within the UK, I have found that we didn't need to do a separate test to go in. If you're doing a master's program, that is, um, your undergraduate degree from the University of Ghana can usually get you in the top schools within the UK, which sometimes happens to be one, two within the world. So the University of Ghana degree is recognized um, by these universities as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you don't have to get a perfect GRE, um, GPA score. And what I'm hearing also is that the University of Ghana, Ghana is an accredited school that we can use to get to other, um, apply to other schools. And just to um, just just one thing to piggyback off of that, um, I know um, men. I, I see there are questions about um, grades being asked um, in the chat as to what type of grades you got at Cape for in order to um, you know to, to to enter the undergraduate. So I'll um, allow Altia to answer that. But for me, um, when it came to when it comes came to um, graduate, sorry entering um, grad school in the US. You know, many of you may be asking, okay, then what type of grades they're looking for? So typically, if you have a GPA of three or higher, you're gonna get into a pretty good school and you can get some sort of funding. However, that doesn't mean if you have a credit, you're, you're, you're out, right? So like if you get a 2.7, a 2.8 GPA, you can still apply. However, um, what happens is that Many people think that you have, you know, just your GPA is, going, is, is needed in order to get into grad school. That is not the case. There are many other factors that um, play a part. Um, some of those um, factors include your statement of purpose. So if you can write a very good statement of purpose stating, you know, why you want to do this program and you speak to something of the sort like, okay, then, you know, you, you, you tell a story. And you say, okay, then this is where you started. This is where you are, you know, and you give, you, you speak to the person that is reading it, right? You have to sit in their shoes and you have to figure out how they would want to read it, right? And um, you write a good statement of purpose. That's one of the things you can do. Have good references. So speak to people who are, you know, supporters of yours. So you may have had a lecturer at university, you know, who um, can speak to your work ethic. So you may not have got good grades, but you know, you were always there first in class. You were always contributing. You were always asking questions, you know, so they can speak to that and your um, work ethic. The other thing too, is you want to build on your experience. So for example, um, many student, many schools provide funding as teaching assistantships. So if you can become a tutor at a university, you want to use that because that will give you the experience in order for you. So when you put that on your um, resume or your CV, you know, it becomes very attractive because they're looking for people who can make that um, jump from student to teacher as quickly as possible with, with very minimal training. So there are a lot of um, teaching assistantships that can grant you funding. So if you can become a tutor, whether it's teaching at a high school or, you know, doing, um, tutorials at the University of Guyana, that's going to go a very long way in towards helping you not only to get into grad school, but helping you to 
you know, become a, um, helping you in terms of funding, right? So those are just a couple of things you want to pay attention to if you have a low GPA and you're, you're, you're thinking, oh, no, I'm, I'm screwed. No, you're not. There are many other things that contribute to that and you want to pay attention to that. Right. Yeah. So thanks. So for the other panelists, feel free to jump in at any time. We're going to freelance it for a little bit. So I'm not necessarily going to ask you questions, but if you feel as though someone could benefit from some additional knowledge that you have, um, feel free to jump in. I'm just going to um, just reiterate what Dr. Paris is saying in the comments also. Um, so there are different types of students that go into um, pursue advanced degrees. There is the traditional student, the student who probably moves from high school to undergraduate to graduate degree. And then there are some students who go and they get a lot of professional experience under their belt, 15, 10 years of professional experience under their belt. And they, at that point in time, when they're probably in their um, late twenties, thirties, they now decide, okay, I want to get an advanced degree so that I can leverage that advanced degree to pursue some other, um, some other job prospects. So for those um, folks who have that professional experience, that's a good um, point to include in your professional, um, your personal statement, because that shows professors that they, they, you have that experience that other folks don't have. And it, it's not always the board of, what do you call them, um, Winston? The board of the committee that reviews your, your, your application, they do not always look for you to see if you are stellar, G, um, have a stellar grade for your GRE score. They're gonna look to see if you volunteered at, at since Anne's organization, if you're, you're, you're someone who is a well-rounded student because they're also trying to see if you can be resilient and you can contribute to sometimes for, for example, undergraduate, if you're going into undergraduate schools, if you can contribute to the basketball team or, or different teams that you might, um, they might be interested in, in you um, joining so I'm going to pause there. I know I'm saying a lot. I see Kalisha and then Althea has her hand up. So just to add um, quickly, if you're in a profession that requires a license, so for example, doctor, dentist, accountant, lawyer, um, in Canada specifically, there's a there's a, a, a accreditation body that deals specifically with those professions and what you can do is write to that organization. So they have a, they would have their list of, of things that they're looking for, but you can also write to them and ask them to waiver. So for example, for if you have a, a law degree, like how I came to Canada with a foreign law degree, so you have to do either a minimum of five courses or maximum of 10, but you can write to them and ask them to, um, you know, take write less courses because of either your work experience or you know something of related to that. There's you can also ask for a waiver of the work placement. So for for me, um, there was a requirement to do like an eight months um, mandatory work placement. But if you have sufficient work experience outside of Canada, you can also ask them to waive that. I'm not sure. I haven't come across any scholarships for those type of. Um, um, programs. However, the good thing with 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 um, the accreditation organizations is that it's it's a self study program. You are allowed to do it at your own pace, and you can take one or two courses at a time. So, you know, the, the it's less pressure in terms of coming up with the finances. So, I just wanted to add that um, quickly. Mm Hi. -hmm. Uh, yes. Um. And sorry about the video, it's giving me trouble right now, so I will leave it off for now. But um, well, first I wanted to answer um, the question I was asked by Miss Uzi. She asked what CAPE grades I got. Um, I did 10 subjects. Some of them were, you know, level one, level two, I did physics one, physics two. But I did, I got seven grade ones, two grade twos, and one grade three. I had to dig in the archives to find that one. But, um, but I do want to, emphasize what everyone else was saying. I focused on um, grades because that's something I had going for me, but they do want to see, you know, 
well-rounded, I guess, resumes or portfolios when you apply for not only for university, but for scholarships. So I also, I I volunteered in um, the Georgetown Leo Club. I had an internship in a structural engineering firm before I applied for college. So I included those things in my application so that I could show that I have done other things to kind of, you know, round out uh, my portfolio, I guess. Um, and then I aim to do more such things when I got to university. So that is important. It's not just about grades. Um, if you have great, good grades, that's great. Sell that, but you know, also try to bring up everything else. Um, so that's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I would encourage the panelists to also take a look at the chat. So if you feel as though you can respond to some of the questions, um, you can jump in at any time. Um, so there's someone in the chat saying that you could also apply to schools um, outside of the US. The the um, application process is less rigorous. Rigorous. Um, I have not, or no one in the panel has not study out, um, studied in the places mentioned there. So if um, anyone is interested in studying outside of the US, Canada, or UK, um, just feel free to chat, send a message in the chat, and maybe the person, um, Mr. Inkabi could probably respond in the chat to give you some more information about that. So um, yeah, so there, there are different ways in which you can get into to schools. Um, one of the things that I wanna talk about is having that conversation um, with a professor, for example, when you're ready to apply to a graduate, um, a graduate uh, degree or program. So um, I'm wondering if Dr. Quentin, you can talk about that, that conversation that you should have with a professor when, for example, wanting to go into a PhD program in analytic chemistry, what does that conversation look like? Uh, great question. So it's probably going to be unlike anything you've had in Guyana, because um, I, I can only speak to like the US and the UK, right, because that's where my experience is. So I'm going to speak about that. But, um, you know, um, and this is not a knock on um, Guyana or anything like that, because it developed the structure that I have in my life, and I'm appreciative for it. But I just had to relearn how things are done in the in this country when I came here. So there is not really that you know, that hierarchy or that hierarchy, hierarchical system that um, exists, you know, within the Caribbean as, um, as a whole. Many professors, for example, my professor, she is world renowned. And I went there and I kept calling her Professor Waisaki, Professor Waisaki, Professor Waisaki. And all the locals were saying, Vicky, Vicky, Vicky. It took me two years to call this woman by her first name. Right. But that that's just the system. And when you get there and when you're talking to these people and you want to interact with them, you have to speak on their level. And one of the things, especially trying to get into graduate school, you have to show that you are a person who is capable of doing things on your own. So you cannot go to um, when you're talking to lecturers and so on and you're trying to get information to them. You can't go to them and say, hey, um, Professor X or Professor Y, you know, I'm here and I would like to um, apply for your school. I don't know what I want to do, but I am willing to, you know, do whatever you want me to do. Or you, I, I may be able to, you know, say things like, um, you know, you, you, you don't want to start from, the, from that point. You need to have in your, I, your head what you want to do, why you want to do it. How is going to help where you're coming from, right? Because professors don't have a lot of time to do um, to, to, to speak with um, students. And the worst time to speak to a professor is when they're writing a grant, right? So you may catch them at that wrong time and you tell them the wrong thing and that's it. So you want to have, a, you know, you want to do your research. You want to look at the type of research they're doing. And you want to be able to say, okay, then, you know, speak to some of this, you know, like, for example, oh, um, you know, when I was in third year in my chemistry program, I did this experiment and it, you know, it caused me to be excited about this. And I saw mass spectrometry, I never used it because we didn't have an instrument, but, you know, it piqued my interest, you know, something like that, right? So you want to speak to things that you hold similar with the professors. You want to be very confident in who you are. 
right? Because you, um, that's one of the things that they look for, you know, um, confidence. So you want to be confident in who you are. You want to be confident in what you're asking. You want to do your research and you want to go to them with a plan. This is how I am going to help you. This is why you need to hire me. That's basically it. It's like you're going for a job, right? This is what I'm bringing to the table. And this is why you need me. Not why I need you. This is why you need me. And over here, that goes a very, very long way into, towards um, getting into the door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and other panelists could, could feel free to hop in and, and talk about their experience um, um, chatting with professors um, for, for their, their programs. But this probably particularly is most relevant to folks who want to pursue a, a PhD. Um, because um, for a PhD, um, it's more of a specialized, you're going into a specialized field of interest. Um, so with probably with a master's degree, that conversation is not as important, but um, to have with a, a professor outside of probably looking for funding and wanting to, to pursue the degree um, at that university. But when it comes to pursuing a PhD, and I must add this caveat, um, it is a myth that you have to have a master's degree or a postgraduate degree to enter a PhD program. Um, I have sat in classes with students with a bachelor's degree, and they've gone from a bachelor's degree all the way into a PhD, and, and that's totally acceptable. So I would say that international students might have it um, a little bit more challenging to transition from a bachelor's degree um, all the way to a PhD um, because some the, the currency to get you into grad school or PhD program sometimes is a network. So what I found is the domestic students, they know of their, they have their professor and their professor knows a professor. So sometimes it's that conversation that happens behind the scenes that you're not aware of that gets you into a program. And that doesn't mean that you cannot get into a program with a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. It might need, you might need to do a little bit more needling. Um, Althea talked about contacting um, Dr. Trotz, um, who's in Miami. There are different ways you can work your network to get into programs. So just keep that in mind. And um, yeah, that conversation is very important because with a, a PhD, um, you, the professor is looking for you to align your research with their research of um, area of interest. And if there's not that perfect alignment or close alignment, chances are you're not a good fit. So it's important to realize and, and do your homework, look at publications. I saw Dr. Paris talked about looking at publications, where have your, what, what research is that professor conducting um, to, so that your work is perfectly um, or closely aligned with that professor's area of interest. Now, one of the things that we talked about, I'm gonna bring in the other panelists off here. Uh, one of the things that we talked about is culture. Can, can, you, can you talk some more, other panelists talk some more about culture and was it a culture shock for you to study abroad um, or was it easy for you to navigate and to settle into to studying abroad? And anyone can feel free to jump in. We have some folks who are frozen, and I know some folks are having some difficulty with <laughs> their camera. So it's okay if you leave your camera off. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps I can go first. Um, so the culture for me, um, I will take it in two parts. Firstly, I read a lot about the UK. Um, through my interest in One Direction, I would say that my values were very much misplaced um, when I was doing research. And because of my like of that group, I started reading about their country, um, reading about the things that they did and all of that. So that really got me interested in what the UK had to offer. And um, Prior to going anywhere, I always do tons and tons of reading. I check out Google, I check Google Maps, I see what's around. I read what other people have written about the place and I try to get a sense of what it's like. When I arrived in the UK, I was the only master's student staying in the dorm with undergraduates. 
and it was Freshers Week. Freshers Week is the first week of school and there are tons of parties and lots of other things happening to get people to get social. So I used that opportunity to get to know the folks who were there within my dorm. Although we were not in the same program, it was a great opportunity for me to get to know them. The majority of them were from the UK. Now for my master's program, I was the only female and I was the only person who was not from the continent of Africa. Everybody else was from the continent of Africa that chose to do my master's program, which is quite interesting. Uh, so I would say that is perhaps the biggest shock of culture I got in my classroom where my fellow classmates had a very different culture from me based on, you know, just my interest interactions with from the continent of Africa and things that I'd seen. It was easier for me to connect with the persons from the UK because I was consuming their media a lot. I was reading a lot about them and some of the things that they did and some of the things that I did was a bit close. I started going to church there. So it was very easy for me to fit in and settle in and I did not feel um, any term, any kind of culture shock. I did feel culture shock in the U.S. when I went, when I did a fellowship there. So I worked in the U.S. for a year through a fellowship. And I would say that that experience was very different. Um, I, I don't know if perhaps it was because I was living in Manhattan and that town experience where you would be walking down the street and you could tell somebody good morning and folks have no time with you. It took me two months to realize that I was getting depressed just because I didn't get that sense of community that I got when I lived in the UK because it was much easier for me to at least talk to people and smile with them and folks were helpful. So it was easy for me to fit in in the UK, in the US, in Manhattan specifically, everybody was about their business and nobody had time with you and they were doing their own thing. I had a roommate who was on the same program with me and her advice was, if you're leaving the house and you're going to point A, focus only on getting to point A. I know you're accustomed to greeting everybody in the street and talking to people and seeing familiar faces and stopping at places. Just forget about it, that will not happen here. And I had to take that approach, which I wasn't comfortable with, but I needed to do it to fit in in the US. Whereas in the UK, I found that culturally it's similar to what I was accustomed to here. Well, when I lived in Kent, I don't know if it was different in central London or some of the, you know, some of the city parts, but it was quite easy for me. Um, with the large African population, I also had foods that I knew. So I was able to eat just like if I was back home and try out some of their foods too. So it wasn't much of a big shock for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and can the other panelists jump in and probably talk about like courses? How how are courses different from you know abroad and and from studying in Guyana and any other thing you would like to add? So Althea, I see you were on. Music. Yes, I was actually gonna kind of piggyback on something that um, Monica said, which is the difference uh, in the feel of community in the U.S. And like that's something I can definitely relate to. And I'm not the most outgoing person, but in Guyana, I had my people, you know, you go on the street, you can hang out with any, you could can you can connect easier with people. In the US, it was so different. It was so despite uh, me trying to go to their various um, events, networking with people, there's the way that they interact with each other, the things that they consider fun were so different to mine, I could not connect with them. It also didn't help that, and this kind of goes into courses in engineering, I was a minority, not only in that I was female, but also that I was Black in a predominantly, you know, Caucasian and male industry. So being there, kind, I was a lot more isolated. So that was something that I had to deal with, you know, how to um, grow into kind of being solitary. And so that was definitely probably the biggest thing that I had to deal with. Um, in terms of courses, I don't know how it relates to UG, but the classes were gigantic, especially um, in your intro courses, you have like a thousand students in the class with you. So um, 
that's one big thing I guess people should know if they're going to a university, especially a big university and, and USF is not even a big university per se. So um, that's probably the comment I would make about courses. And so you can expect that professors won't be as attentive. You have to be very on top of your own work. Um, but there are um, what they call professors hours where you can go and communicate with professors. And I definitely use that resource. And I would advise anyone who does study abroad to use that resource because you build relationships with professors and they will help you a lot more. Um, they'll be willing to be lenient in lots of cases, especially if you have emergencies. I have a professor basically let me take a final uh, the day before the actual final date because I had an interview. So that was kind of my relationship with, with courses and professors. All right. All right. So what I'm going to do now, um, there's a lot more that I could add to this conversation. And I am sure the other panelists have a lot more experience. So I'm going to pause with my questions because I have a lot more questions. I really want this conversation to be beneficial to those who are on the call. So I'm going to ask folks to, um, if you haven't already, um, just write your comment in the your question in the chat. If we haven't seen the question before, just add it again, and we're, we're going to try to get to those. Also, um, feel free to use the hand raise um, emoji, and, and we're going to try to get to you and have you unmute yourself to ask your questions. So I'm going to begin with Jarl, and then we're going to go over to Rashida. Go ahead, Jarl. You can unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, good night, everybody. Thank you for sharing everything that you shared. It was very um, insightful. Um, I just have one question, actually. Um, I heard you guys were talking a lot about um, acceptance and what it takes to be accepted. Um, in my case, personally, um, I've already been accepted to one of these um, international universities to study something that I'm pretty interested in. I got accepted to study chemical engineering at the University of British Columbia in Canada. But uh, as was as is the, was the case with a lot of our panelists tonight, I don't particularly have a um, method of funding that as of right now. So um, I was wondering uh, what your opinion would be on the feasibility of writing to, let's say, the Ministry of Public Service um, in an attempt to get funding or sponsorship for this? Mm -hmm. All right, so anyone could feel free to jump in. I'm going to pause for a moment to see if anyone has anything to add on the panel. Is this for an undergraduate or a graduate degree? Uh, this is for undergraduate. Okay. Yeah, so from my knowledge, um, oh, Onika, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to share from my experience. Um, you may hear that you need to wait until a specific scholarship is advertised, but I would tell you to go into the ministry, write your letter, go into the ministry and request the scholarship. In your letter, be very specific about who you are, what you want to study, and how it will contribute to the development of Guyana. The thing about the ministry is that the people that they're funding, the expectation is that these individuals will return to Guyana to work and develop the country. So if you are not able to properly articulate how your degree benefits the country or your plans on returning to Guyana, that makes it just a little bit more difficult. And if you have any sort of experience volunteering or doing things within your community, that would also be excellent to mention in your letter, even if it's not the ministry and you're writing to a business place or someplace else. People want to know it's more than just the financial need. They want to know that the person they're sending or the person they're giving their money to is actually going to make the best use of it and is a deserving individual. So be sure to say everything that you've done, why you've been doing it, how this will contribute to not just your own growth, but the growth of your country and definitely apply. You never know what can what the response would be and apply to other businesses too um, because coming through the government you'll return and be bonded um, with another source you can return and work elsewhere so there are several things to consider but definitely write that letter 
character, um, be sure you address it to the right person. Don't be like me. And then um, go in, deliver it, and definitely follow up. Don't submit the letter and forget about it. If you need to be there every day until you get a response, you do that. So they will know that you're serious about what it is that you're uh, trying to do. Right. So um, go ahead and, and um, very insightful responses. Go ahead and continue to add your questions to the chat or raise your hand um, using the hand um, emoji. And we're going to be sure to get to you. One of the things that I would add is also um, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Um, some, there are different avenues to get in funding. So the Ministry of Public Service can be one, one avenue. And as um, Onika had mentioned, the, you will be bond to um, that return to probably contribute your years of service for probably two to five years. It just depends on what they put in your contract. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, definitely pursue that. I've seen folks use GoFundMe pages. I know it's probably embarrassing to ask, professionally ask for money. I don't feel, don't feel embarrassed about putting yourself out there and asking for money because your funding might not necessarily always come from a ministry. There might be someone who's living overseas who's interested in, in funding you and um, they might be able to see your, your, your um, acts and be able to, to fund you um, outside of um, any of the ministries in Guyana. So that's one of the things that I would, would, would encourage you to do. And um, yeah, check on websites also and, and see if you can get scholarships from the school. Um, there are also scholarships that some of these schools um, schools advertise and also check check our chat there's some folks dr paris and some other folks that are in the chat giving some really good information so check check the chat for additional insight um rashida do you have a question um good evening everyone um can i just start off by saying thank you so much for this this is exactly what i needed <laughs> um so my question i think would be a bit more specific to miss althea um i'm currently in fifth form currently sitting the CSEC examinations. And I was just wondering um, what would be the likelihood of being accepted into a college overseas based solely off of my performance at CXE? Hi, so thank you for that question. I will say that, um, oh, I guess I will. I was hoping my camera would work, but I guess not, I'll turn it off for now. Um, I will say that all the advice that I was given when I was thinking about this transition was CSEC is not as recognized by um, international universities. I know I heard Onika say that um, that's not necessarily the case in the UK, but at least for the US, uh, I was told that this is not particularly recognized. And um, one benefit of doing CAPE for me was that some of those credits were considered in my first year. So I had I could skip some courses and therefore I didn't um, spend as long in my degree program. So it was cheaper. So that's another thing to consider. So um, I don't want to discourage you from pursuing um, the path of going straight from CSEC to um, university, but I am not particularly qualified to answer that question, I don't think, but I would recommend um, attempting to pursue CAPE because it does have other benefits apart from maybe giving you a better chance of getting into university abroad. I hope that answered your question. Um, I kind of have a follow-up question to that as well. Um, so, you, the thing is, um, here you always hear people say CAPE is kind of a waste of time, you know, <laughs> but um, that doesn't really correspond to what you're saying currently. So, um, uh, considering the SATs, um, what can I um, do the SATs right after um, CSEC, or should I do CAPE first? Or you yeah. can do SATs right after CSEC and I think the SATs are actually required for most, at least US universities. Um, so even if you did CAPE, you still need to do SATs. Um, but I would definitely would not say that CAPE is useless. Uh, even if, for <laughs> example, even if you took courses that were not applicable to the program that you decided to take, the experience that you have doing CAPE, I think helps prepare you a lot more for the university experience. 
because you have you at least for me in Cape, I experienced the larger classrooms. I experienced the more advanced workload, the this kind of you know independence where you have to make sure that you're on top of your your classes, you're doing your your IAs on your own. You know, kind of in CSEC, you're carried along a little bit more, I think, and it's a little bit easier, I would say, at least when I was doing CSEC and Cape really kind of brought me out of my comfort zone and made me push myself so that when you go to university, you're kind of in that that advanced mindset, so to speak, and you're better able to cope with those classes. Um, I was a tutor in at university for a few years. And even in the US, the students that went from high school to university, they couldn't transition to that higher workload. So for that reason, I would um, recommend CAPE as well. Okay, thank you so much. Did you yeah, want to add something um, to that, Dr. Quentin? Just to piggyback off of some of that. Um, yeah, I remember when I was doing CXC. My goodness, it's a while now. But um, <laughs> I, well, there was, I, I guess I was one of the very first batches to do CAPE, right? So I think the first batch to do CAPE too, actually. So um, it's that long, but there was A levels. And I remember um, my pastor back home, he, uh, Professor McGowan, advising me that, you know, um, it, it is a good thing to do sixth form because just as um, Altia was saying, it, if anything, it prepares you for university um, life, whether it be at University of Guyana or it be at um, university outside. Because what it does, it does help you to become a little bit more focused. It helps you to see things at an advanced level. And then the other thing is that universities out here, students are joining when they're like 18, 19 or whatever. So their equivalent is to our A levels when they do all of these, um, what do you call them? Um, pre-university classes, pre-AP classes, all of that stuff. So it's kind of similar to or analogous to, you know, what we would do at CAPE or at A-levels. So you're not starting from, you know, a disadvantage. You are actually starting at, um, you know, the same level or in some cases an advantage. Because I know a lot of people like to dig, you know, oh, CSEC, um, CAPE, A-levels, oh, it's a waste of time. It, it doesn't do anything, but trust me, it prepares you and it really helps. So you would not, you, you wouldn't have to spend the amount of time that you would have had to do if you just came straight out of CXC, getting up to speed. And then the thing about it, the culture over here is in universities, classes are very quick. They move very quickly. You don't stay on one topic for too long. It's one topic this week and next topic this week, um, next week, and you're constantly having assignments and homework. So if you don't like homework and don't, you don't like assignments, you better get accustomed to it because you're going to see homework and assignments like you've never seen before. And there's no, there's no way of catching up. If you miss something, you're way behind. Right. Yeah, so there, there are a lot of insights. And to those folks on the call, we're going until 9. So feel free. You still have some more time to, to put your questions in the chat. Um, we have Kalisha, who lives in Canada. She also owns a law firm. Um, if you have any questions for her, um, feel free to. This is your opportunity to ask questions. Um, one of the other things that I would say is um, with regards to um, studying abroad. Um, can Onike, can you speak to your work experience abroad? Because most of the panelists have talked about going through an undergraduate or a graduate program, and, and that's how they've been able to um, pursue a higher education abroad. But your experience is somewhat unique because you've also um, applied for a work internship for something like that. So can you talk about those folks who might be like non-traditional students who might wanna have um, additional experience abroad but might not be interested in pursuing a master's or, or, or a PhD? Can you speak to that work experience? How did you apply for that? Where did you work? So folks can become a little bit more familiar with other avenues of studying or living abroad. Yes, um, definitely. So, 
So, there are some persons who may not have a desire to pursue a master's or may not want to go through the university route. But they prefer to learn on the job and that that is where fellowships come in. For me, um, this fellowship came through my job. I, I worked at the, the Department of Environment. So, Anika, we're having some trouble hearing you. In the office of the well, the previous Department of Environment within the office of the president here in Guyana. And um, there is a capacity in states for climate change negotiators. So as these larger countries, they may need negotiators states. And I'll be saying AOCs from here on up. Funding professionals for one year. Yeah, we're, we're having... Yeah, we're having, let's circle back to you a little bit later. We're having some trouble hearing okay, you. Okay, sure, no problem. Yeah. Um, so there, there, there's a lot more that we can discuss. So again, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just spend some time talking about living abroad. Um, for some folks who might not be familiar with um, the transition from graduate school to now living abroad. Can folks talk about that transition, like what process folks can go through to, if they want to um, remain in the country, um, what process does that look like? There are different things like F1, H1, B, H. There, there's so many things that you can talk about. So um, I know Kalisha, you, you own a law firm. If there's any insights you can share, Dr. Clinton, can you talk about that transition from school to now wanting to settle abroad? So I am going to speak specifically to Canada because I know the immigration laws are different. Canada and U.S. has different immigration laws. But one of the important things I would say is know exactly what you want to do um, from the beginning because um, the, the path that you take affects like your ability to stay here, uh, stay in, in Canada, um, and I, I'm assuming the US too, after you complete your study. So one of the important things is to ensure that the school that you're selecting is, in Canada, we call them designated learning institutions. So if you go to a school that is not a designated learning institution, your degree will be recognized, but then you wouldn't be able, for example, to get a, the, perm, the work permit that they give to international students after they complete their studies. So generally in Canada, they have this program where you can get a work permit, minimum one year, uh, maximum three years. Um, it, it's tied to the length of your program. So um, the, you have to ensure you're selecting the right school that will qualify you for that work permit when you're finished, um, when you're done doing your, when you complete your studies after you graduate. So knowing exactly what you want from the beginning is important. Um, for some people, you may just want to get the work permit to get the work experience and go back home. For others, you may want to stay permanently. And um, if, if that's something you want to do, there's quite a lot of things you have to consider. I would say from the beginning, know exactly the immigration programs that are available to you. Um, there are a lot of things that I wished I had known earlier. So um, look and see which programs you may be eligible for because things such as your age could be a factor that may make you ineligible for a certain program. So for example, if you are 33 years old and you're coming into Canada to do, let's say a master's degree, you want to ensure that once you land in Canada, you try to get into that, that immigration program 
um, even though you're still an international student, because by the time you're 35, you lose clients in, in, in some of the immigration programs. And then by the time you reach 40, you, do, you get zero clients. So knowing exactly what you want to do from the beginning is very important in helping you choosing um, the right path. I would also add to that, you know, doing things like your research. So for example, um, you know, just basic things, look and see like what the banks are offering for international students, look and see what organizations that are there to support international students. Most times when you look for these things on the internet, you wouldn't find them. You'd, you'd most, most likely see um, organizations in Canada that supports new immigrants. But what people don't know is that these organizations actually support international students. And I wish I had known that when I was still in school because there was so much that I learned after um, finishing school and there was so much that I could, I could have achieved and you know fin completed earlier. So doing your research is important. Um, you know, financial planning is also important if you want to stay in Canada and, and of course the US or the UK after you study. And there were some basic things that I didn't know. For example, for me coming from Guyana, um, I avoided use it, using um, credit cards. So when I completed school and of course, you know, you started work and then you're looking for a place to rent, of course, they're, they're going to be looking for credit history. And, you know, I didn't have that because I just stayed away from, from using credit cards. So it took me a little longer going, you know, just navigating some of the basic things. So researching and knowing what you want from the, from the get-go is, is important. Right. So I see a question in the chat from Tyrone. Which school in the U.S. would you recommend for someone to study um, set physiotherapy. So I would say for that, um, Tyrone, go to the website, um, US, US News and Rankings. US News and Rankings. Could you put the, the link in the chat for me, Ethan? Um, yeah, go to that website. You're going to see it in the chat um, very soon. And one of the things that I would encourage you to do is look for schools um, that are ranked differently. So some folks might have a desire to go to schools that are the top ranked schools that offer um, physiotherapy. Um, if that's your preference, when you go to that website, you're gonna see um, they're gonna rank the schools from number one to number 10. And then of course, you're gonna look for the courses that folks, the school is offering and see if those courses align with your interest and the later things that you wanna pursue in, in, in life. So um, there's a lot of homework that you have to do for that to see um, if the school is a good fit. Um, it does not necessarily mean that you have to go to the, mo the highest top um, ranked school um, in the US. There are different programs that are offering um, different degrees in physiotherapy. Um, it all depends on what foundation you have because depending on where the path that you wanna take next, a school that's ranked number 50 in the country might be good for you to get into, um, um, get into your next job prospect. But I would say, yeah, look for that and um, that should help you to figure out, there's the link in the chat, figure out what school you wanna to go to. Um, we have about 10 minutes remaining on the call and I see a question from Shanika. Um, Shanika Grant, can you go ahead and unmute yourself and let us know what's your, what's your question? Good night, everyone. My name is Shanika Grant. Um, I'm 21 years old. I graduated from high school in the year 2018 with 10 CSEP subjects. I did not do K. I went to the University of Guyana where I did public management and I am now pursuing my degree in public management. I'll be graduating in November with my degree. However, I would like to pursue a career in dentistry and specialize in orthodontics. I cannot do that in Guyana. So my hope is to attend an HBCU. My question is, do I need, do I need um, subject specific at the CSEC level to get into a dentistry program? For example, bio, physics and chem, because I was originally in the art stream where I did human and social biology. So do I need to do physics, bio, and chem before I apply for the dentistry program abroad? 
for my university degree be an asset will that push me over the edge or that help my application anyway even though it's in a different field so that's a great question um a number of things to touch on touch on there so many times when students join um um, start university here what they do is they like if you want to become a doctor or whatever they they do pre-med or they may start a first year program like um just like it's done in Guyana where you can do biology chemistry physics and then after a year you can apply for you know medical school so I think in your case that would be the that 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 would be the route that you would probably have to take because you don't have any history in um you know the sciences you can apply for a science, um, you know, program because there are students. I know students who came from liberal arts colleges or whatever, and they were able to do science. Sub, they were able to do um, pursue the science degrees or whatever. So um, one of the things that you can do that um, I think Alti also spoke about that would help you is if you are going to write the SAT, you probably want to do like a. Um, you know, look for the subject matter sets that you're doing. So not only general, but I think um, there's subject matters that you can you can focus on on writing those two. That will help in your case. But yeah, I don't think you're gonna get away from having to do like at least a year in an undergraduate course or whatever, and then transition into the dental school or you know whatever that is. So that's the route I would I would think would be your best option. Yeah, so thank you. For, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Shani. Um, so there the folks on the panel, none of us specialize in dentistry, but that was great information um, from Dr. Clinton. What I would also say, um, sometimes if some folks don't have the answers, um, you can use the route where you DM folks, so direct folks. There's Twitter, there's a lot of folks, there's an entire community of dentists on Twitter just slip into their DMs and ask them, hey, I want to study abroad. I'm an international student. And some folks like talking about their experience. As you can see, folks on the panel are very welcoming and, and want to talk about their experience to assist other folks who are coming um, through that path. I, I would say don't be afraid to reach out to folks, even if it's a cold call. Um, some of them might respond, some of them might not respond, but you might get a more um, targeted answer to, to that question. But that pre-med option is definitely um, something I've seen folks do when they want to get into um, any field of um, for for medicine or, or um, folks fields related to medicine. Um, yeah, just to um, just to piggyback off of that. Yeah, um, one of the things you need to realize is that Google is your friend, right? So, yeah, if you just do a quick Google search, there are a lot of um, just as uh, Dr. Little Quinton was saying, you know, there are a lot of um, organizations and so on out there that you can connect to. So if you do like a quick Google search for, you know, international um, dentistry in the U.S. for women or something like that, you may come across an organization or two. And not only would someone be there to give you advice, right, but they may be able to help you with a scholarship too. a lot. There are a lot of scholarships and fellowships out there, especially for um, women and minorities in, you know, in things like STEM, in things in, um, and, and the nature. So, you know, just connecting with the right group, Twitter, you know, the Twitterverse. Instagram too. So Instagram is not only for, um, you know, looking for the latest um, stuff there, there, there are people who, you know, have all of those things out there. So yeah, just broaden and look at um, all those different things and you might come across that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, networking, the old school networking that you you probably have heard of, um, where everyone goes into a room, and you have a cocktail or you drink some some you 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 eat some food and you're able to chat with folks and ask about their experience. Um, the world is moving away from that, and there are different unique ways to network. Social media is your best friend. Uh, connect with folks. And even again, if it's that cold call, don't, don't be afraid to do it and follow up. Anika had mentioned this. Um, some of folks get 
fall fall through the cracks because they send that first email and then I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't hear from the professor. Oh my goodness, I didn't hear from someone. And they go back into their shells and then they forget about it. So following up with whomever, if it's twice, thrice, probably on the fourth time, you probably and if they don't respond by the fourth time, you know, are well, they're, they're not going to respond and then you probably hop over to someone else to try to connect with them to see if you can get some more insight into that. So we have five minutes remaining. So I want to just hop back to the panel. Um, if no one has any other questions to see if the panelists have any um, other words of advice or encouragement or anything we didn't touch about on that um, you think would be beneficial for the attendees to know about. And then we're gonna wrap up. So I just wanted to, um... I just wanted to say, um, to give some words of advice. I see that there's a um, hand raise. Um, yeah, we can, we'll get, to the, we'll get to your question. I just wanted to um, say something before going forward, especially with regards to the application process. So I don't know if you may be a freshman or a, um, sorry, I, I've got accustomed to this, a first year or second year student at the University of Guyana. And you may be saying to yourself, you know what, I have time. Well, um, what I wanna tell you is that the entire application process, it takes about a year. So you wanna start at the, probably at the end of your third year, right? Because what happens is that typically if you're looking to start in the, so in America, there are three different um, semesters. There's fall, there's spring and summer. You don't wanna apply for summer because those are very limited in terms of the courses available. So there, that leads fall and spring. You um, Fall is preferential because that's where you get most of your fellowships, scholarships, and so on, right? So if you're looking to apply for the fall of 2023, you need to start in August 2022. Why? Because December 31st tends to be the, um, you know, the first deadline for early admissions or for um, early registration. And if you're looking to get funding or whatever, you want to be among that early admissions. So you want to start in August. If you're going to be right, if you're doing, um, you know, a graduate program, you want to start, you know, studying for GRE. Studying for GRE takes like two to three months. And you'll need all that information in your application packet that you have to submit by December 31st. Right. So those are things that you want to um, pay attention to. The other thing too is you want to look at um, make a short list of schools because whenever you're applying for college over here, you have to pay an application fee. And the average application fee is around four to five dollars. It can go as high as 75 to a hundred dollars for some schools, right? So you may not be able to apply to every single school. So you want to go to the school sites, you want to look at their programs, you want to see which ones interest you, and you want to choose like three, four, probably six the most. And then you can build out an Excel sheet, um, spreadsheet and you list all the documents they're looking for, all the different requirements. And you want to ensure that you, you, know, you check all of those and you keep checking it. So those are things that you want to do. You have to be very, very intentional about it, right? Because um, it is a long process and it is a very arduous process. And sometimes it can be a very frustrating process. But at the end of the day, when you get through, it can be quite rewarding. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add to um, kind of the application process that Dr. Quinton was talking about. Don't be afraid to ask questions. So I was very, very vocal when I uh, was applying to universities. I reached out to their international services department, their admissions department. I asked, like, do I need this? Do I need that? Is there anything additional I need to send? Just don't be afraid to communicate. That'll be very helpful. And also, I would say try to be as prepared as possible before you go in terms of where you're going to live, how you think you're going to pay for it, um, what program you're going to get into, what you need to, just anything you could think of that you should research beforehand because I have seen a lot of international students, they go there and they try to figure it out while they are there and it's a lot more frustrating and, and it may not be as easy to get through that way. But I will say that being at a school like USF that has a lot of diversity, when you go to schools that have a lot of diversity, they tend to invest a lot more in international students and international student resources. So, for example, USF had um, 
a specific international student orientation where they provided you with resources. They told you where you could go to get loans, where you can go to get affordable housing, where you can go to get um, affordable insurance um, programs. So things like that you should be looking for as you are applying to, to schools. You know, what resources do they have for you as an international student to make your, your process a little bit easier? Yeah, that's a that's a great point because um, one of the things, and I'll I'll speak to my experience. So when I did my um, masters, I did it in London. So in London, I was able to live like an hour away from school because all I did was get on the train, go into Victoria Station, and then I got on the tube and I went into North um, the North Campus, right? So. I was living like 60 miles from school, but it took me an hour and it was very um, convenient. When I moved to Arizona, I didn't do any research. So I was like, oh, this is America. You know, there's buses, there's trains, there's everything. So I'll just get on the train and I'll get there. I rented an apartment that I really liked that was 10 minutes away from school. That first year was miserable. Why? Because there was no trains. There was just a bus system and it came, it, it came once every hour. And my first semester, I had to teach at eight o'clock in the morning. I used to have to leave class. I, I used to have to leave my apartment at six, six fifteen in the morning to get the bus to get to school. So before you go, you want to go and Google, go to Google Maps, find where your school is, find how close the apartment you're interested in, look around the apartments, see if there is a supermarket within walking distance or whatever. You know there are going to be some small. You know, different universities are different ways. Not every place is like New York, right? So you may need to have, like in Arizona, I had friends who lived very close to campus and they had they bought a bicycle and they were able to ride to school. And then they could ride to campus or whatever. They could ride to the um, supermarket and they can get the things, right? Another good resource is niche, N-I-C-H-E dot com. That you can go and you can look at the statistics. You can look at demographics. You can look at the crime and safety of all the neighborhoods and so on, right? You want to look at that because they are in many of these big cities, um, you know, living close to campus can be very um, not good. That's where the robberies tend to happen because that's where all the undergraduates live. They leave their dorms open and so on. And there are a lot of robberies that happen. So I'm not trying to, you know, dissuade anyone from, you know, living on campus or whatever, but you just want to ensure that you're in the in a place where you're safe, right? So, and then the universities, the web pages, they, especially the large universities, they give you all of that information. You can go on the web website and look for housing and they'll tell you these areas you can live, these areas you can, um, you know, you need to look, look out for because they're a little sketchy, et cetera, et cetera. So you really, really want to do all your research. Yeah, lots of preparation before you, you go to a school and um, overseas. Kalisha? Yeah, just to add to what everyone else say, I would definitely say don't be afraid to reach out. Um, I, when I was in the process of applying, I reached out to the International Students Coordin Coordinator at my school and she was really helpful. It just happened that she um, came to Canada as an international student also. So she was able to really guide me and walk me through the process. And even for things like housing, right? Um, sometimes they're aware of housing that is not, you know, accommodation that is not advertised on the university's website. And so, for example, you know, she might know like a group of really good students who are renting a house, but one of them have just completed their studies. So they're looking for another roommate. So she may be able to say, well, oh, yeah you're coming in, you know, you can, I can connect you with these students. I would, you know, I recommend, you know, they're good students to live with. So don't be afraid to reach out. Also, you can reach out to the professors. I reached out to one of the professors at my school before I even applied. And it just so happened he was familiar with what, with the, what I wanted to research and um, with what was happening in the mining industry in Guyana, to my surprise. So he was really able to guide me even in, in preparing for my research before I even applied to the school. So don't be afraid to, to reach out. And for Canada specifically, there are a lot of scholarships that are available for masters and PhD programs. And tuition is generally cheaper in the smaller cities so and, and, and less populated provinces. So if finance is an issue, look for a province that is not as populated. You know, go to a small, like, you know, for here, it would be Manitoba or Newfoundland, Ontario and British Columbia. Those are you know, two of the most expensive provinces in terms of 
um, in terms of tuition. So that's just a little bit that I wanted to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what, what it is for um, international students, but some folks, some domestic students, what they do also is they go to a community college first, which is offers cheaper um, tuition. And then they transfer over into like a Big Ten university, Ohio State or, or other universities. So I would pay attention to going to those schools in lower and um, smaller provinces. It all depends on what you're looking for. Some folks want um, big city experience. You know, they want to experience the lights and the glitz and the glam. Um, I attended Penn State Harrisburg. That it was desolate many times, but it was there were tumbleweeds <laughs> rolling across the street. Like in Arizona, yeah, with the heat in Arizona. So, <laughs> so the, it, it all depends on what what you're looking for and what your pockets and your parents could afford. So, different options and avenues to get to the same destination. And remember, it's it's not a a, a linear path. Sometimes you have to navigate to get to that same destination or outcome. So, I want to know if Onika has any um, closing words, and then we could try to just sneak. Ashmita and I think Ashmita has a question. I just wanted to add um, a very little quick thing about housing is when you apply to university, make sure you know if in your first year you have to stay on campus or if you can stay off campus because I did not know that that was a thing. And fortunately, I was able to stay off campus. That was the first year they let students in their first year stay off campus. So you need to make sure you know that because it is ridiculously expensive to stay on campus. That's just my, my word. <laughs> Yeah, most universities in, in the U.S. on the graduate, you have to stay on campus in your first year. That's correct. Anika, I have some more to add, but I'm, I'm going to let Anika speak. Anika, can we hear you? Yeah, I think we're still, if you can hear us. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. I just wanted to thank you. I just want to echo the center. Uh, you would need to Google your school. Yeah, Onika, we were having trouble hearing you. Um, perhaps we could take Ashmita's question and I'll just type any final comments in the chat. Yeah, we can hear you clearly now, by the way. Um, Ashmita, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, good evening, all. I'm a 10th grader who writes his second examinations until May 2023. And I would like to um, inquire about the SAT testing process. Like, is there the digital setting available for us international based students? Or if there's not, then does Guyana have a testing center that you guys know where we can go and write it? Um. I don't know if anyone else did SATs here, but um, I, when I took SATs, I believe you could have done it through School of the Nations or they were somewhere else, but I did it through School of the Nations. And so that was a testing center, but I studied everything through the SAT um, online web webpage. So not sure what options are available now, but you should be able to research that, but I believe School of the Nation still does it. And yes, I see Onika's confirming that School of the Nation still does that. So I would probably reach out to them first. Um, and I think that was your question, how to do SAT, but I don't know of a, of a digital option. I only have the option to do a testing center. Okay, thank you. I will try to reach out to them. All right, folks. Um, so Onika, I'm not sure if we can hear you. Um, so. I could try again. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Um, I'll answer the question in the chat. Um, getting a second scholarship from the government is very possible. Um, it's not unlikely, um, but they will know of your academic track record and they will know all of your details. So it wouldn't be a case of you can now plead your case with somebody who does not know of you. They would have had all of your information prior. Uh, but it all depends on what the government is in, what sector the government is interested in in that particular year you're applying. Some years they may want to have more agricultural specialists, more doctors or whatever is available. So definitely apply um, and see what happens. My final words would just be to echo what everyone has said. Do your research 
read your read about your school google see what other people have said google i literally googled scholarships for masters and whatever came up i just read to see if i applied for it's coming from a developing country um this is the first time it's a plus because there's several scholarships for persons from developing countries. Um, there are scholarships specific for persons for, from it for, uh, who are of Indian descent, um, African descent. So there's a lot of things that um, you can do and that you can have. And don't be afraid uh, to tell persons that you've been accepted and you don't have the finances. Um, I had to do a food sale to raise money to pay for my visa process. This is before my scholarship money came in and all of my friends supported me um, with my food sale. So definitely, you know, there are unique ways to go about it. Um, you must be persistent and you must be willing to work for it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much everyone for joining. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can type in Dr. Espinel Quinton and you're gonna see me on LinkedIn. You can connect with me. Um, if all the other panelists wanna share um, any ways in which folks can connect with them, do so in the chat. Kalisha has a law firm if you're interested in um, immigrating to Canada. She's a great resource to connect with, um, with any questions that you have um, regarding immigrating to Canada. Um, other than that, our other panelists, I want to thank you very much for joining this discussion. I really wanted to hold a space where folks can really ask questions because I've recognized that some of this information is a little mysterious. So I'm hoping, I'm hope, I hope that we were able to um, demystify some of the process of applying for scholarships and even living abroad. We haven't been able to touch on um, all of the different aspects of living abroad or even transitioning to remaining in the country. But hopefully we can touch on that in another um, upcoming uh, panel discussion. So thank you very much panelists and thank you everyone for joining us. Do have a very good rest of the evening.